Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. You're in the study with Pastor John and Pastor Matt. We're in 1 Peter tonight, beginning a verse-by-verse -verse study through 1 Peter. Tonight's topic is Christian identity and salvation, or, I, or you could say it in many different ways. You could say identity and salvation in Christ. Looking today just at chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Um, I have some announcements and some general comments to begin, and then Pastor John, will, if you have any announcements, comments, and then if you would pray for us before the Bible study, that'd be great. Um, first of all, I, I just wanted to share in a general way about what's going on right now, no matter how this coronavirus situation is impacting you. I'm willing to bet that there's some kind of new difficulty for you or some kind of new trial, new stress that you're trying to walk through by faith. And it's most likely that God is using it to sanctify you. And so that's something we can pray for each other about. It's something to have your, your eyes up to look at what God is doing. And um, my encouragement in, uh, in a general sense is be sure that you are in prayer. Be sure that you are in the Word. Uh, the general structure of spiritual growth hasn't changed. Uh, our basic needs, spiritual needs, haven't changed. The way that God ministers, ministers to His people in a general sense has not changed. So be in prayer. Be in the Word. Look for Christ and look to Christ and rest in Him. Cry out to Him. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say, just in a general sense, for what's going on and this does connect with a lot of what Peter talks about, although we won't get into it tonight. Um, no matter what trial or suffering comes your way, nothing in the world can take from you what you have in Christ. Nothing can take away the inheritance of eternal life that you have in Christ. And um, I hope that's an encouragement to you. It certainly is, certainly is um, to me. Pastor John, anything that's on your heart to share? So you mentioned... Uh god being compared to a rock in the prayer time and th that's a passage that i've shared with several not the one you read from but another one psalm 62 verses 5 through 7 the whole psalm but these three verses i'll read my soul wait in silence for god only for my hope is from him he only is my rock and my salvation my stronghold i shall not be shaken on god my salvation and my glory rest the rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Uh, God knew exactly where David was, David's circumstances. He knows exactly where we are in our circumstances, what the challenges are. Think about Israel coming out of Egypt, following the pillar of cloud, and they get to the Red Sea, and the army's right there. God knew that, and God had a plan for that. So just trust him in this time as Pastor Matt was encouraging you. And uh, let's go to prayer. Father, we come to you thanking you uh, for the rock on which we stand, the rock that we come to, the rock that is higher than I, the rock that is our strength. Lord, yes, you use this image, this object lesson to encourage us, and we are encouraged. So, Father, those who are waiting upon you for the resumption of their employment, and we know some in our fellowship in that, uh, that that's the case with them. We, we pray you'd give them patience. You would sustain them through this time. And Lord, we pray for, again, our leaders to make wise decisions Amen. with regard to that. We thank you that human life is being um, valued in this. We thank you because we believe in the sanctity of life. And so uh, that's good. And the wisdom to know when to do other things, just help with that, we pray. Lord, creation groans, but you are on your throne and we mm. thank you. Amen. Father, uh, in a special way, bless Camp Womi too. I mentioned them in the prayer time, but Lord, um, it's been difficult for them. Uh, they haven't had anyone there. 
in the last month and a half, and uh, May is very much in doubt. So you know, you know all of those circumstances. I don't need to recite them. I pray that you would bless Frank, the board uh, who watches over that, uh, the ladies auxiliary, I think it is. Bless them, sustain them, we pray, into the future. And Lord, bless our study now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And boy, church, we sure do miss you. We we cannot wait to have things opened up. And, um, you know, we know that us and our church and our yeah. ministry is not the center of the universe. But we miss you and we love you. And we're thankful for the uh, the amount of communication that we're able to have. I was just going to say thank you for the kind comments about this format. Do not think that it will continue once we're able to assemble again. I mean, we might put more on Facebook. I think we're learning something there about the value of that. But in the study is a short-term project for now. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, okay, First Peter 1, 1 and 2. Understanding Christian identity and salvation. What I'd like to do, Pastor, is read these verses just to give us a grounding. Then I do want to um, take a step back and give four overview points about First Peter as a whole. And that'll take uh, less than five minutes, I believe. Uh, but let's look at the, the, our two verses first. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If you look at a map, that's modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. Verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, I know that's just his greeting, and I, I don't think we'll even get to that last clause there this evening because of how much is in these verses. But, boy, isn't that what we need, to have grace and peace multiplied to us by the Spirit of the living God. May grace and peace be multiplied to you, be heaped upon you and given to you from God. Just know that what he sets up, what we will be talking about, makes that possible. Amen. Our, our relationship with the Lord that we're going to be looking at most particularly makes that grace and peace multiplied to us possible. Amen. Amen. Treasure of treasures. Now, uh, <clears throat> Pastor John, these overview points were not in the outline that I gave you. So what I'd like no, you to do <laughs> what I'd like you to do is as I go through them, if you want to plug anything in or interject, these will be quick hitting. Just go That's ahead fine. and do that. Okay, so I just have four overview points about Peter's basic message. He's first of all, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to church members. Okay. And one of the main themes, one of the main lessons is uh, hope in the midst of suffering to maintain hope in the midst of suffering, which implies we have to know what that hope is and then to live out that hope and live in light of that hope in the midst of suffering. One verse that begins to capture this is chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, love this phrase, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope yeah. through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So much to say about a living hope, and we will when we get there. But to have hope in the midst of suffering is one of the main themes in First Peter. Yeah, so while you're looking for your next point, uh, hope is a grand theme in this uh, scripture. Uh, Peter will talk about those distressed by various trials. He'll talk about those tempted by fleshly lust, waging war. He'll talk about unreasonable masters. He'll talk about disobedient husbands, the fiery ordeal, uh, sharing the sufferings of Christ. He'll talk about the, those that were being persecuted, those being targeted by the adversary, the devil. So uh, 
a variety of ways that it was difficult for believers at this time, and he is giving them a word of hope. Yes, amen. So hope in the midst of suffering, and number two, um, obedience no matter what. We're called to Christian obedience no matter what, no matter what the situation, no matter what the difficulty. Another way to say that would be <laughs> we are called to holiness no matter what holiness no matter what and one uh verse that captures this it's his parting words in 5 12 the end of it i have written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of god stand firm in it and that's how he closes and that's how he, that's how he summarizes what he just did in in this letter uh he's expounded and declared and exhorted in terms of this great salvation that's found in Christ. This is the grace of God. And then there's um, an imperative, stand firm in it. Yeah. Uh, number three. So now you have those two, hope in the midst of suffering, obedience or holiness, no matter what's going on, that's our calling. Uh, number three, faith in Christ as the foundation for both of those. Faith in Christ is the foundation for both of those. So hope is not uh, a vague spiritual feeling. Um, obedience and holiness needs to be biblically defined. That's not a subjective idea. That's not, not just subjective religious ideas that you might have. This is right. Uh, that is right. I need to do this. I need to do that. But both of these need to be grounded in the truth of the gospel faith in christ is the foundation for both of these and when i when i say faith in christ um, and i believe this is biblical if it's not uh let me know check me on this i mean that as representative of of our whole identity in christ and so it includes um everything about who we are in christ and of course that's based on who Christ is and what Christ did, what Christ did for us, what he's doing in us, faith in Christ. Who are we uh, as a people who've been united to Christ? That That's the foundation of everything else. Uh, a, a verse or a passage that begins to sum this up is chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. We'll come back to this later. As you come to him, it's a little vivid picture of uh, the christian life it's coming to as you come to him a living stone rejected by men but in the sight of god chosen and precious you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ and so he begins to explain some of the details of what it means uh, to live as a christian but it's rooted in this where are people who are coming to christ anything on this faith in christ uh, yeah i mean i i can't read those two verses without saying he is also telling christians that you are the people of god so as we look at the old testament and think about the people of god he's using old testament language to describe us in Christ, and and what an encouragement that would be, to to um, well to the Jewish believer, but also to those who who knew um, uh, where you know knew the, the 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 legacy of the apostles and so forth, like Peter being Jews, that now they are they are the temple that God is building. It is more than a physical building; it is a church. Amen. Amen. So go back to that sense of hope that they would have had being dispersed in various places struggling but knowing that they're identified as the people of god hope in the midst of suffer, suffering obedience no matter what's going on faith in christ is the foundation for both of those and finally um this fourth overview point peter um is is really big on this point that christ's suffering is not only what saves us but it also sets an example for us his mm -hmm. suffering he was righteous yet he was rejected and he suffered as one who did no wrong in order to save us but also to set an example for us peter says this explicitly in 221 for to this you have been called it's part of our calling right to this you have been called 
because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Follow in what steps? Follow in his steps of suffering in obedience for the glory of God. That's the overview points. Any any closing words on those overview points before we go into this, the main study? Press on. Press on. Okay. Uh, number one, understanding identity in Christ. Now, this is interpreted or translated and written out different in different uh, translations. I have the ESV, the English Standard Version. To those, verse one, to those who are elect exiles. Okay, New American Standard would have aliens and then, but chosen, but it will come later. Uh, King James would have strangers and then uh, elect later on. Uh, elect exiles, uh, chosen aliens, uh, elect strangers. You have these two sides of one coin to use <laughs> such, a, such a common, it's so common, it's almost a boring illustration, but I think it's a good illustration. This is the Christian identity. Uh, and there's two sides of it. In the eyes of God, you are elect. You are chosen. You are precious in God's eyes, elect. But you're also exiles. In relation to the world, out of place, often rejected, do not quite fit in. We are elect and we are exiles. We are both of those simultaneously Everything in First Peter teaches Christians what exactly does this mean and how do we live out this situation as those who, who are elect of God, chosen by God, but yet strangers, aliens in the world. Um, I have some cross-references for that, but as we're easing into this, Pastor, anything on, on either of those phrases or both of those phrases together? Well, just the idea of being an alien in this world means our hope is not in this world. We are not trying to carve out a piece of Christian turf on this earth. We're trying to be his witnesses looking forward to his kingdom, yeah. which is much greater than anything this world has. Yep. Yeah. Amen. So Amen. alien is something we are because of what we have become in Christ, but it's it's also a mindset. This, this world is not my home. Yep. Yeah. Yep, and we have some cross-references that we will get to on that. Oh, I jumped ahead, sorry. No, that's okay. I just want to let you know we're getting to the cross-references. Um, uh, okay, so, so brief definitions. Elect. How about, how about try this on for size? This means chosen by God's sovereign grace. Amen. Okay, and exiles uh, means not citizens of the place we live in not citizens of the place we live in yeah so look at the verse peter an apostle of jesus christ now, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in pontus galatia cappadocia asia and bithynia um so this would have been for them in a in literal earthly sense um exiles these these were either Jewish Christians, um, and they were outside of Palestine um, as a result of Babylonian captivity many years earlier, or these would have been um, Christians from Rome who, under the reign of Claudius, were sent out uh, to colonize, co colonial, colonial efforts under Claudius. Um, you can, if you get a good commentary or a good study Bible, you can look at some of the different options and arguments for that. I believe uh, Karen Job, uh, in, Karen Jobs, in the Baker Exegetical Commentary, makes a good argument that these would have been Christians from Rome who were deported under Claudius. But either way, Peter uses that situation of his first audience as a metaphor to give them a, a deeper spiritual meaning of their place on earth as Christians on earth. Um, now, the, the cross-references I have three, and the first one actually comes from 1 Peter. So look with me, just flip, flip the page or flip two pages to 1 Peter 2, and we'll begin with verse 4 and 6. Because this two-sided coin of being chosen and precious on the one side, but also being um, 
uh, like a stranger and an alien on the other side is patterned after Christ himself. The Christian's identity, the Christian's place in the world is patterned after Christ's place in the world. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 6, we just read this. As you come to him, you know, he's going to describe him. He's going to describe Christ. A living stone who is what by men? Rejected by men. Rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Chosen. Same word as in uh, one one. You yourselves are like living stones, uh, being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. Verse 6, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, that's Jesus, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Again, same word, chosen. Chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So Jesus came, came to his own, but he was rejected. Precious in the sight of God, elect in the sight of God, chosen by God, and yet rejected and put and um, put to public shame by men. But all those who are found in him, they will never be put to shame. And then one more here in 1 Peter 2. Let's just skim down to verse 9. Okay, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It started with this phrase, chosen race, talking about believers in Christ. Chosen, they're chosen in him. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, beloved, I urge you, don't miss this, as sojourners and exiles, sojourners and exiles, sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul, and keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. You're surrounded by this world and it uses i don't think you could use stronger language um, passions of the flesh waging war against your soul but you're a sojourner and an exile you don't really belong to these things um i'm going to flip to my other cross references pastor anything on this point no i'm enjoying the cross references. okay go cross reference hebrews eleven thirteen. these all died in faith it's it's that faith chapter and so he's talking uh, about abraham all those who came in the faith before him these all died in faith not having received the things promised but having seen them seen them by faith having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth strangers and exiles on earth people of faith from old those who came before us strangers and exiles on earth who lived by faith who walked by faith based on the promises of god and one more philippians 3 20 and 21 our citizenship is in heaven now are we in heaven no we are on earth but our citizenship is in heaven and from it from heaven we await a savior the lord jesus christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. We've been talking about that a ton this past month. Yeah. He will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So understanding your identity in Christ, we are elect and chosen and precious in the sight of God. But in this world, we're strangers, sojourners, aliens, exiles, visitors, guests, not citizens of the place we live in. That's all I had for tonight <laughs> on that point. On that point. No, no, no. Yeah. And so telling us who, who we are and now we're going to dive into um, just more deeply um, what we should think about that.
yeah. in, in, in the next verse. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good way to put it because the reason that's our identity is because of the salvation that right. we've received, right? The sal salvation that we received in Christ, and that's the point we're on now. Number two, understanding your <laughs> salvation in Christ, understanding our salvation in Christ. The salvation that we've received uh, defines who we are. Our identity is based in that. Uh, and this is coming from verse two, verse two, and it begins with a prepositional phrase, according to, okay, according to. So what is that picking up on? It's it's picking up on particularly the word elect. You could say elect exiles, but in in what way are we elect? So what he's doing is modifying, further defining right. what does that mean and where does that come from? We are elect, verse 2. So that's a part of Bible study. Yeah. To, to attach the phrase according to to where it goes in verse one. Yes, yes. And you said you wanted to point out yes. things about Bible study. <laughs> yes, that's that's another thing um, I didn't put in the notes, but Pastor John and I were talking. I said, you know what? This would be a great opportunity <clears throat> for us as we're doing these to point out little things here and there about how to do Bible study just as an equipping exercise. So the, in this case, it's grammar. What is it modifying? What is it pointing back to? And yes, uh, I agree with you, elect. Yeah. Um, and there's three things here, okay? We are elect, number one, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking notes, you can just write down according to. Um, secondly, in the sanctification of the Spirit. So you could write down in. And then finally, for obedience to jesus christ and for sprinkling with his blood and uh there's one preposition there for and i don't know how how does um you have new american standard right could you read that last phrase for us from yours <clears throat> to obey jesus christ and be sprinkled sprinkled with wait a minute where yeah, I, is that mm -hmm. it? To, be, yeah. to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. Yeah, good. So it's it's um, one preposition that it begins with for um, obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with His blood. And I'm ninety nine and a half percent sure. I, no, I said ninety nine point eight percent sure that in the Greek text here obedience and sprinkling go together yeah, it, it, it yeah. would read literally like this for obedience and sprinkling by the blood of jesus christ or something like that they, they go together anyway so there's not four things here there's three there's according to the foreknowledge of, of god the father in the sanctification of the spirit for obedience and sprinkling by the blood of jesus christ um two overarching points and then what i want to to look at with you and you looking at wherever you are is each point okay what what is what does it mean to court that we're left according to his foreknowledge what does it mean that we're left in the sanctification of the spirit uh for and for obedience to jesus christ and sprinkling with his blood but an overarching point it we have to realize the trinitarian nature of this redemption the only god that exists is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Eternally one essence in three persons. And his redemption is a Trinitarian redemption. All the works of God are works of the Father, done in the Son, by the Spirit. They have different roles in the work. In the work. God manifests himself in his works. And so part of his works is to reflect that he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you see that here in, in, the, in this, how Peter talks about redemption and our, our basic understanding of salvation. It's not advanced Christian thinking. It's just basic Christian thinking that you, we've been saved by the Father and by the Son and by the Holy Spirit, who each had a different part in that salvation. But it's a Trinitarian redemption. And um, the second overarching point is this. If you notice... We'll get into this as we as we break it open, but I want to give you a homework assignment as I do this in the form of an overarching point. Um, you'll notice that our salvation and our redemption includes 
something that was done before time existed. Something that was done, you could say it this way, from the foundation of the world. All right. Which is how the Bible says it. Yes. <laughs> that's I, a, so that's a good way. I to took say it from it. the Bible. <laughs> Words matter. Um, foreknowledge of the of the Father. So so our salvation includes something that was done by God before time existed, before creation existed. It also includes something that was done in time, in the past. So before you were living, before I was living, in time, in the past, and just because we're on this verse, I'll just point out uh, this phrase, his blood, his blood. Jesus came, lived a righteous life, died in the place of his people, shed his blood for our sins. That was done not before the foundation of the world. That was done in time, in history, but before we existed. But it also includes, salvation includes something done before time, something done in time, in the past, but also something that's done in time in our lives we can go even we can zoom in even closer in our hearts in our lives in our hearts um sanctification of the spirit sanctification of the spirit so just an overarching point when you think about your redemption it's not just um a religious feeling that you have it is something that was done by the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, includes something done before time, in time, but in the past, and in your own life, in your own heart, in your mind, everything about you. That's that's overarching understanding of our salvation. I believe that is a basic understanding of our salvation. Pastor, anything on these? Oh, oh wait, wait, hold on. The homework assignment is Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Ephesians 1, oh, 3 yeah. to 14, okay? Because what I just said and what Peter writes here in verse 2 is taken by uh, Paul in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. I don't know, historically, I don't think he took First Peter to do this, but I just mean the theology and the teaching there is stretched out in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. And it's the same thing, Father, Son, Spirit, before time, in time, and then in your heart. Verses 3 to 6 in Ephesians 1 is the Father's work in redemption. Verses 7 through 12 in Ephesians 1 is the Son's work in redemption. And verses 13 and 14 in Ephesians 1 is the Holy Spirit's work in redemption. So that's your homework assignment. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Pastor. So two things, and they go together with the same phrase, on the same page. Peter and Paul are on the same page Amen. in talking about our salvation. Well, because the Spirit is inspiring them to write the text of Scripture. Also on the same page is the Trinity, uh, working out our salvation, Father, Son, and Spirit. So um, we see that in many ways, uh, not only our salvation, but many other ways that's demonstrated in Scripture, but it's exciting to dive into that in, 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 as Peter does here with regard to our salvation, uh, as we'll talk in the practical points, gives us such confidence and assurance to know these things. Amen. Boy, I would really say uh, amen to those two words. Uh, confidence and assurance. Confidence and assurance. These doctrines are supposed to give us confidence and assurance. <laughs> um, they're not meant to confuse us. It's not meant to distract us. This is the found. This is what we've received in Christ, and they're meant to strengthen us and encourage us. Okay, let's look at foreknown by the Father. The way I'm going to do this is give a basic definition or a basic explanation of what this is. Give some cross references, and then I'd like us to try to say something about general practical relevance, practical application of these points. So um, foreknown by the Father is right there, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Chapter 1, verse 2, section A, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. His foreknowledge is not based on our salvation. His foreknowledge is not based on a decision that we made but our salvation is based on his foreknowledge. A decision that we made, a spirit wrought decision that we made, is based on his foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is the foundation. Foreknowledge is what it is based on. That's why he begins with foreknowledge. God's foreknowledge is not based on our salvation, but our salvation is based on God's foreknowledge. 2 Timothy 1 9. Uh, one of those verses that should blow our minds. Um, 
First or Second Timothy one nine, uh, picking up from the previous verse, God talking about God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. By the way, and this isn't in my notes, you you can't have one of those without the other. In other words, don't think you're saved if you, if you have no desire um, to have a holy life or a holy calling. He saved us and he called us to a holy calling. This is the danger of cross references, by the yes. way. <laughs> it's part of the fun of cross references. <laughs> but the danger of it, not a bad danger, just a, we want to go further in the verse yeah. than, than why we picked it as a cross reference. That's right, yeah. Um, not because of our, he saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us, this is the mind-blowing part, purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Amen. What does New American Standard translate? From, from all eternity. From all eternity. So, um, based on his purpose, right? Because that's what it says, because of his own purpose. Um, we received grace when? Before the ages began. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mind-blowing. Um, now, that should drive us to worship and, and cry and shout thanksgiving like never before. One more here. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, hmm. whom is so important. It's not what he foreknew. It's whom he foreknew. He foreknew people. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And then Ephesians 1, 4, I already gave you that one. Uh, that's where Paul says it in Ephesians 1, is Ephesians 1, 4. But the, the, Romans 8, 20, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And um, I did have one thing early in those notes that, that I skipped over, just the nature of foreknow or foreknowledge. It's not just intellectual. Over and over and over again in Scripture, to, to know someone to know God or for God to know people is relational knowledge. There's an intimacy there. It's not just an intellectual uh, box to check. Oh, I know that exists. No, it's a connection. It's a relationship. He foreknew us before time began. Yes. Yeah, so this doctrine, um, I find tremendously exciting to see it over and over in scripture and the effect it has on my heart, I think that the intended effect of scripture, let me put it that way, is humility and uh, just an amazing sense of um, being the Lord's, mm. being God's, uh, being his people because he made that, he knew beforehand for knowledge, he knew beforehand um, that he would choose me, mm. that, that I'd I don't know what to do other than be thankful, be humble, um, take confidence and assurance in it, as as we said earlier. And and just think of who Peter, and I know we need to get on, but think of who Peter is, is writing to and how good, because they've been moved, whatever the reason was, they have been scattered into these different areas. And he reminds them, God knows that. Mm -hmm. God knows you. God uh has brought you into a saving relationship with Christ. He has you where you are spiritually in Christ, but also historically where they are. I mean, that's what we begin to see too with the foreknowledge of God. It goes beyond his control over bringing souls to Christ. It's his control over all things, which is why the verse before Romans eight twenty nine speaks about all things work together yes. for good. That's a part of, well, foreknowledge is a part of his sovereign nature. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yes, sometimes I'm dumbfounded yeah. by it. I think you really summed up well. The main relevant response we ought to have would be just utter gratitude, yeah. thankfulness, humility, and worship. And, and worship. Indeed. Um, number two, sanctified in the spirit sanctified in the spirit he says this verse to according to the foreknowledge of god the father in the sanctification 
of the Spirit. Being saved is a work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's not just receiving forgiveness. It's not less than receiving forgiveness. Okay, please don't hear me the wrong way. Being saved is receiving forgiveness and receiving a new heart from the Holy Spirit. It's both of those things. It's being it's being spiritually united to Jesus Christ. And one of the blessings that flows from that is being forgiven in Christ. Amen. And one of the blessings that flows from that is being given a new heart that flows from Christ. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2.13 we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And so he's linking there also conversion and sanctification. Uh, first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit. Salvation is a work of the Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, basic to Christian identity. We're people who are progressively being more and more sanctified, but the only reason that can happen is because in the past we were sanctified. Yeah, that's an important <laughs> we were We were pure, purified inwardly by the Holy Spirit and consecrated, set apart for use in his kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6.11, such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Again, talking about their past conversion, they were sanctified in conjunction with being justified as they came to Christ by faith, as they came to Christ by faith. Uh, Pastor, anything on sanctified in the spirit? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so election foreknowledge the the choice made this is how the choice is i don't know how to say it but carried out in time mm -hmm. um <clears throat> the spirit's work so when you think of of your testimony when you became a christian the spirit is doing that that work and and the result of it with the meaning of sanctification is is um a setting apart uh, a, a making holy uh, i remembered a song as i was thinking about sanctification today <clears throat> by a christian artist way back honey tree somebody here knows it uh and you're as old as i am um the song was clean before my lord mm. and just that title ah to know that from that point in my history i have been sanctified now i know i still sin i know there's a process of sanctification but being brought into Christ, being sanctified by the Spirit at the point of salvation, I am clean before my Lord. And that is what gives me confidence to stand before the Lord, to come before him in prayer. I wouldn't have any confidence if it depended on my daily achievements or my daily, um, you know, my ongoing sanctification because I falter in that. Yeah, yeah. You know, we... we we make progress and some days we we don't but um but because of this work of the spirit uh, we can we can come before the lord we can come confessing our sins but we can come we can come amen that's one of the great promises of god all throughout the old testament all throughout history is i will sanctify you i will pour out my spirit various ways of saying it all right number three okay so Foreknowledge of the Father, sanctified in the Spirit. Number three, oh, I have these as as four, I believe, in your outline, yeah, but, but I'm taking them together because yeah, they, they do go together. Yeah, they do go together. Obedience and sprinkling by the blood of Christ. Okay, obedience and sprinkling by the blood of Christ. The end of verse two, for or unto obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. And so, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, is what our salvation is based upon in the sanctification of the spirit is how we received that salvation okay what it is based on how it's received and now this is what it creates this is what it leads to it creates and it leads to obedience to jesus christ and sprinkling with his blood now under obedience uh, there's many different ways you could do this but i came up with this short outline i think this could be helpful for you um one two three the seed 
of obedience that needs to be planted in the sinner's heart for him to become obedient to God. The seed of obedience, the root of obedience. So as that seed opens up and begins to take root. And then the fruit of obedience, what it looks like in all of life, practical living. I have for the seed of obedience, a spirit-given faith. A spirit-given faith. As the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit of God, saving sinners as they freely come to him in Christ by the power of the Spirit. The seed of obedience is a spirit-given faith. The root of obedience is a spirit-driven love, a spirit-driven love. It is a love for God that previously did not exist in the sinner's heart, now exists and is taking root in the sinner's heart so that he loves God and loves Christ and loves the things that God loves and loves holiness, not perfected in love, not perfected in holiness, not perfected in obedience, but truly rooted in a spirit-driven love for God that is new to the sinner who's been saved by grace. So the seed of obedience, a spirit-given faith. The root of obedience, a spirit-driven love. And the fruit of, obe of obedience, spirit-filled life in holiness and good works. This is what God is doing in his people and through his people. It's a gift from God to us. Spirit-filled life in holiness and good works. The seed, the root, and the fruit. And I have a, a devotional passage for you, John 14, 15 through 24. It's that passage where Jesus is teaching um, that... If you love him, you'll obey him. If you don't obey him, don't want to obey him, and desire to obey him, what is that doing? That's just proving that you don't love him. Um, Pastor, anything anything on obedience? Are, are you okay? You're gonna. Talk. You can go ahead to sprinkling. That's fine. I have no, some no, no. things. But... No, I'm gonna let you go to sprinkling, and then I'll double back. Okay, he's doubling back. Sprinkling well, because we were taking them together. Yes, we can do that. Um, so my comment has them taken together. I apologize. Uh, that's. That's you, fine. You go first. <laughs> um, it wants us to picture blood being sprinkled. Okay, blood being sprinkled. The imagery there of um, the new covenant, the blood of the new covenant. We should be thinking about the cross. Yes. We should be thinking about Jesus Christ and his body. Um, hanging on the cross and bleeding the blood shedding the blood of the new covenant the blood that atones for our sins as our substitute sacrifice before god sprinkling uh to be sprinkled with this blood means to be walking in the grace and in the mercy of the new covenant in christ's blood to be walking under the grace and the mercy of the new covenant in christ's blood purification in our spirit, purification in our conscience, purification and consecration for proper use in God's kingdom. Hebrews 12, 24. Actually, no, I'm going to save my cross references. I'd like to save those in my back pocket. I want to hear what you have to say on this. A little while ago, I mentioned that one of the things Peter is doing is applying Old Testament language and pictures and to God's people, the church. And he certainly is doing that uh, in this phrase with the word obedient and the word sprinkled. Um, what I thought of was Exodus 24, verses 7 and 8, and see if you hear those words. Then he took, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, and this is at, this is after uh, Mount Sinai and they're committing to uh, the covenant. Um, they said, the people said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And so the old covenant was enacted with the people of Israel at Sinai. Well, you know, we Peter using those pictures is and those words is talking about the new covenant, the better covenant in Jesus Christ. So I wanted to point that out. And, and when I think of obedience and when I think of sprinkling, I think of one way that that's practical for me is Lord and Savior. Mm. 
Lord and Lord, I want to obey him, Savior. I, I will never forget what he purchased for me at the cross. But those two things give me and give you, brother and sister, your identity in Christ, Lord and Savior. We are Christians. And Peter is pointing out, I think, as he does throughout the, the letter, that that obedience is a part of being a Christian and and uh, uh, being a participant in the sprinkling of that blood, just as they were at, at Mount Sinai. We who have come to Christ are spiritual participants of the blood that he shed uh, upon the cross. So as a Baptist, don't be afraid of the word sprinkle. <laughs> I think it goes back to the picture of, of the blood sprinkling in the Old Testament and, and indeed is talking here about our new covenant in Christ. So um, I see there who we are in, in Christ, to be obedient to him, saved by him. There's something that's so him. important and so relevant for anyone who's listening, whether you're uh, not a Christian or a Christian, the order of this is everything the order of this is so important that god is not calling us to purify ourselves right in order that we might be saved he's not calling us to be obedient and qualify so that we might qualify to come to him for salvation he saves us by a work of grace a sovereign work of grace that we might obey him that we that we will have um this, this sprinkling of the blood and be cleansed of our guilt and be cleansed of our sin that we might love him and, and live for him that repeat that, that order is so important and anyone listening this this very night you can come to god through christ for salvation the only literally the only barrier that's keeping you from that would be unbelief and uh when when each of us are are in our unbelief if we if we think back uh to that time of our life or if you're in it now, we'll all have different reasons that we're conscious of. Well, I don't believe this. I'm not convinced of this. I don't think I need this. Um, I was hurt in the past. This, I mean, all kinds of reasons. But really, the only actual, literal, concrete thing, reason um, that keeps any sinner from coming to God through Christ is unbelief. But you can repent of that unbelief and believe today. That's the only thing that can stop you is your unbelief. And so we want to continue to herald this message and this salvation and the invitation to come, to come. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. Um, you just come and receive this salvation. Now, my two cross references, I'm glad you went there. In the last revision of my notes, that was that had been I never get the last revision. Oh, no, 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 never. Uh, what would be the fun in that? That had been my closing cross reference for every other um draft, but I chopped it about an hour and a half ago to add these final cross references. And then, in God's providence, you did that one anyway, so that works out nicely. What was the one you had as the final one? Um, I had Moses on oh, Sinai that, sprinkling the people, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Apparently because that's have been there. there's so many famous scenes from yeah. the Exodus, yeah, and that's not one of them, but it's so important. Mm -hmm. This Mount Sinai narrative and Moses sprinkling, and um, because that, that's the first thing that happens after the law is given, the Ten Commandments are given, the law is given, and then that covenant is ratified in blood, and then phew, it takes off. Anyway, here are my cross references one's short, one's a little bit longer, and then we'll uh give our closing thoughts and, and wrap up. Hebrews 12, 24, uh, it's talking about we've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel was a blood that spoke a word that called out for condemnation and judgment upon the guilty party. The sprinkled blood of Christ speaks a better word for that. It calls out and demands forgiveness and justification for the guilty party for those in christ now the sprinkled blood of this covenant that speaks a word speaks a word of mercy and forgiveness hmm. now this one's a little bit longer also from hebrews 10 uh hebrews 10 19 through 22 well that other one was um from hebrews 12 so also from hebrews but this one's from hebrews chapter 10 19 through 22 <sighs> what an encouragement therefore brethren 
since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. We can have confidence as sinners to enter into the dwelling place of God Almighty. We can have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Okay, The curtain was in the tabernacle, the curtain was in the temple. And what that represented was the, uh, the separation yeah. between sinners and God. Sinners, you cannot enter. You, there's a curtain. You, you cannot go through here. But Jesus' body is the fulfillment of what that curtain symbolized. And through his blood sacrifice, that curtain is open so we can come through. Anyway, verse 21 and verse 22. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is the reality that all of the Bible and all of history is leading to God creating a people in Christ, holy unto himself, that they might be where he is, that he might be where they are, that he would dwell together with this holy people and they would see him and enjoy him and worship him forever. I love this passage in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. It's a picture of a people who've been made holy by the blood of Christ drawing near to God. You couldn't do that. In the, if, you, if you were uh, an Israelite, you couldn't just walk up to the tabernacle or walk up to the temple and uh, tip your cap and draw near into the holy place and into the holy of holies. You would have been put to death. We can draw near to where God actually is in heaven through Christ. So I'll stop ranting because I love this. I mean, this is everything to me, everything for who we are as Christians. Um, Pastor, any closing comments or exhortations, encouragements for us? So, two summary statements uh, in these two verses. Uh, salvation is clearly a work of God and uh, salvation draws us near to god amen amen yeah um let's do some announcements okay uh first of all if if you've been listening to this or any other of our messages and you're not familiar with our church uh, we'd love to meet you get to know you so comment or message us you can private message us you can go to our website uh northharford.org www.northharford.org and contact us on there through our contact page and let me close this in prayer father we ask for your guidance and wisdom and patience and perseverance and strength father sanctify us according to your truth use us for your purpose in this world it's in christ we ask amen yeah. thank see you we'll see you next time